I'm uh, very happy to be with you here today. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our studies that focusing on how the microenvironment regulate vascular fate and assembly. In general, our lab is interested in understanding what regulates cellular fate to specialized cells, and then how these cells morph into functioning tissue. Specifically, we focus on the vasculature, where the vasculature grow and uh, uh, get, getting into the homeostasis uh, state, but this homeostasis can be disrupted by uh, various extracellular stresses that could happen in, in, during disease development, I listed some here, in injury and uh, in extreme conditions. What we're trying to do in the lab is activate this morphogenesis and in some cases also fate uh, uh, pathways to develop therapeutic countermeasures to restore the function, repair, and uh, towards homeostasis. So which stressors uh, we study? We study low levels of oxygen, hypoxia. We study changes in the surrounding extracellular matrix in flow and strain and radiation. Today, I'd like to focus on a couple examples surrounding the, our work with hypoxia and with the extracellular matrix. So the first study done a, a several years ago, we looked into how the differentiation or cellular or endothelial fate is impacted by hypoxia. Through the differentiation of our uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, through 12 days, by then, uh, back then it was about 12 days, we simply examine what happens when we uh, doing it in a, we do, when we do that in a atmospheric condition or in a hypoxic condition of 5%. And we notice when we culture the cells in, or differentiate the cells in 5%, we start to see these colonies and upregulation of expression of the cadherin or vascular endothelial cadherin marker for endothelial cells. Nicely, we also notice that these colonies are a VIC adhering positive cells that are surrounded by PDGF receptor beta a positive cells, which are parasites. With that, we wanted to understand, is it the early stages of differentiation that impacting the uh, differentiation in hypoxia that impacting the fate or later on? So around the middle of the differentiation, around day six, this is about a mesodermal induction. So we expose the cells to a, a, what we call secondary hypoxic or prime hypoxic, as, as well the a control and continuous hypoxic. And what we have found is that when we expose the cells to a, a, a either a atmospheric condition or later stages of differentiation to hypoxia, we see no upregulation of specific endothelial marker, VIC adhering and CD31. But we saw upregulation of these markers when we expose the cells uh, to early in, during early stages of differentiation to hypoxia. We have done several uh, other uh, Analysis where we show a again upregulation of the adherin CD31 and lectin, as well as the functionality of these cells. This study was published in, in 2014, but since then, what we notice in other published that I just not going to uh, go over right now is that other stresses such as different stiffnesses of the matrices and also patterning of the extracellular matrix will impact this uh, vascular fate. So with that in mind, that we know that hypoxia regulates the fate uh, towards or, or impacting the fate towards a more endothelial uh, cell, we wanted to ask uh, how the hypoxia regulate vascular integration. Specifically, Bria Macklin, who was a, a PhD, students in the lab back then wanted to examine the, the hypoxic retina tissue. I'll, I'll explain a little bit later why we chose this specific hypoxic retina. So the first thing she did, she just uh, compared the iPS-derived endothelial cells and mature human retina endothelial cells when she exposed them to hypoxic conditions and we have and, and we, in vitro and we saw no difference. She did notice that there is some difference in the proliferation rate of these cells in vitro where well, we saw that the hypoxia did not impact the uh, IPS-derived endothelial cells uh, proliferation rate, but it did slow down their proliferation, the proliferation of the mature cells. She then moved to three-dimensional uh, assay where she took collagen gels and formed a network inside these collagen gels in hypoxia. 
And comparing again the iPS derivative to the mature retina endothelial cells. And she found that the hypoxic condition in the a, a iPS ca case a, induced better and more a, a networks compared to the a, a retina a mature endothelial cells. With that, we wanted to go in vivo and ask how we can uh, study more about this, uh, the integration of iPS cells uh, in hypoxic conditions. For that, we used the, uh, we collaborated with, with Elia Dow, who is at the Wilmer Institute at Hopkins, uh, using this uh, oxygen-induced retinopathy model, which is a classic to examine how our cells respond to hypoxia. In, in the, during retinopathy, retinopathy, what's happening is that the healthy vasculature are exposed to a, a, a stress, in this case, glucose, causing the capillary to drop out. This causing hypoxic or ischemic region in the retina, which in, induce pathological neovascularization. What we thought we could do is basically inject the cells in that point where we are generating this ischemic condition, hypoxic conditions, and see if they are going to stabilize a, a, the retina vasculature. So the way this essay goes, we take the PAPs uh, on day seven, we expose them to, or we take them into high uh, oxygen chambers, and then move them back to atmospheric condition, which in, in induce the ischemia. And what we have found and that when we inject the iPS-derived endothelial cells into this, uh, uh, this uh, epoxic retina, they integrate very nicely with the host vasculature. And you can see here uh, in green are the injected cells, either the iPS cell derivative or the mature cells. And, and M-lectin is the mouse uh, lectin. They integrate much nicer with the uh, uh, mouse vasculature. And you can see this clearly in the, these images where we see nice integration in yellow of the uh, mouse and the human vasculature versus the uh, mature retina endothelial cells that basically generating a layer of, of vascular network kind of, of on top of the mouse vasculature. So Bria continued to ask why this is happening. She used an, uh, she came up with this nice essay where she encapsulated in the collagen gel a, a SDF1 alpha, which will recruit endothelial cells and basically seed the endothelial cells on top of this hydrogel, again, put them in hypoxic or atmospheric condition. And as you can see here, that we found that the iPS derivative penetrated better to the, uh, this collagen, either in atmospheric or a hypoxic condition. Indeed, she found in the hypoxic conditions that our iPS derivatives express the uh, receptor for the SDF1 uh, uh, alpha, the CXCR4. And indeed, when we inhibited the CXCR4 using blocking antibody in vivo, when we injected that along with the cells, we see a much less integration of the human vasculature with the host vasculature. So all in all, what we're thinking is happening in the iPS derivative compared to the human retina uh, endothelial cells, the uh, iPS derivative proliferate faster, they're uh, uh, recruited to the host vasculature and integrate much, much more efficiently than, than the uh, uh, mature cells. So we're continuing the study to understand better also how or what is the role of the pericytes in this cascades, which are known to uh, uh, contribute to the uh, retinopathy pathology. Uh, but in general, where we are thinking these, these studies or this area is, is going to, and I think uh, Gordana is, gave a, a good uh, um, overview of what we can do with uh, uh, these the cells in large scales and also in, in, in organoids on the chip is we're thinking it's going towards tissue specific endothelial cells uh, where we'll be able to uh, analyze how the endothelial cells impacting specific uh, tissue or the in the tissue environment that they're in and vice versa, how the tissue environment uh, regulate the uh, functioning of these uh, sp tissue specific endothelial cells. And this will allow us to uh, understand more about organ morphogenesis, develop more precise uh, organ on and cheap more models as well as organoid and uh, hopefully develop a, a personalized uh, medicine and drug uh, discovery in specific organs in the body. So with that, with that, we wanted to understand how hypoxia regulate vascular assembly. 
And vascular assembly is happening in three dimensional. And towards that, instead of taking those collagen gels like what Bria did before and just put them in, in this uh, hypoxic chamber and then take them out and analyze them, what we, uh, Kiyong Ming Park in the lab, what, who was a postdoc in the lab, developed this nice uh, hydrogel system that it's basically has a backbone. It could be a gelatin or polysaccharide such as dextran. And it's mod modulated with ferrolic acid that in the presence of leches, creating this reaction that consume oxygen. What's happening is then that we have hydrogels that while it's forming in the lab, it's becoming hypoxic. So we have hypoxic environment in, 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 uh, basically on the bench. When we add cells in those uh, hydrogels, the cells continue co to consume oxygen and those maintaining these hypoxic uh, levels for longer periods of time. We found that it's uh, with the endothelial cells or endothelial uh, progenitor cells, they're, uh, they're continuing these hypoxic conditions up to uh, 48 hours, which is enough to activate a uh, hypoxia inducible factors one and two, which takes about uh, four to six hours to accumulate. So with this, uh, I'm not gonna get into too many details, but we encapsulated here uh, endothelial colony forming cells. And as you can see here in the hypoxy condition, there was a, a, they, they, they promoted very nice vascular networks compared to the non-hypoxic, uh, which kind of a, a allow the cells to a sprout, but not really form robust network. So through a series of studies, we found that the hypoxia, of course, a stabilizing hypoxic inducible factor, in our case, both one and two, and they upregulate the MMPs that allow the matrix to degrade and then to the a vascular bed be, be, be to form. So with that in mind, we, this was basically our first study that uh, demonstrated that there is a direct loop between a hypoxic condition impacting a, the, the matrix through their degradation. So with that, we thought about how the matrix mechanics uh, regulate this vascular morphogenesis. And, and you know, there, there have been uh, other studies um, uh, that show the, the impact of stiffness on network formation. But we were actually interested in a, a how vascoelasticity regulate vascular assembly. So uh, most of our, our uh, tissues in our body are basically have both elastic and viscous properties. This is a nice uh, review published last year who is demonstrating uh, the vascoelasticity properties of the, of the uh, matrix, their ability uh, to respond to deformation by uh, relaxing uh, over time. So with that in mind, we wanted to understand is vascoelasticity uh, uh, regulate this uh, morphogenesis of the vasculature. So Jai Wei and Rahel Schellemann in the lab developed this nice hydrogel system, which composed from a, a dextran, so from polysaccharide and from gelatin. And we generated two types of hydrogel system. What, one what, with what we call dynamic cross-limping, which allow us to mimic va vascoelastic properties and one that is non-dynamic cross-linking. We made sure that we can uh, decouple stiffness and stress relaxations in this uh, hydrogel. So we can make the hydrogel soft or stiff and, in, and, and maintain that uh, uh, soft and, uh, and stiffness throughout three days in culture. This, these are no, no cells here. And these soft or stiff materials can also uh, differ in their uh, stress relaxation. And this difference in uh, stress relaxation can be maintained over a, a three days of a culture period. So with that, we wanted to understand how they modulate morphogenesis. So quickly, uh, endothelial cells morph into vascular networks through a process that start with vacuole or a small lumen formation, then the cells then sprout and branch and form the network. And indeed, when we encapsulated these cells 
in the what we call the dynamic hydrogel, the vascoelastic hydrogel, they form uh, these beautiful networks versus the non-dynamic uh, hydrogel. We see that they are forming some network, but not as robust and, and uh, complex as in the dynamic hydrogels. And you can see here a luminal structure uh, forming in the uh, dynamic uh, hydrogels, which we cannot find in the non-dynamic hydrogel. We then wanted to understand more what is the mechanism uh, that regulate this process. And uh, we first uh, examined if the vacuole and lumen formation process, which takes in culture about four to six hours, is modulated between the two hydrogel, and we did not find any difference. Both of them allow the cells to undergo vacuole and, and, and small lumen formation. Then we hypothesized that what's happening in our hydrogels is that uh, the uh, dynamic hydrogels allow the cells to contract and push and allowing them to sprout. And this does not happen in the non-dynamic hydrogels because they are not flexible. And indeed, by, by encapsulating fluorescence bead and following them with time lapse, we could see that the fluorescence beads move while uh, we have cells in the hydrogels move a, a, a further and faster in the dynamic hydrogel compared to the non-dynamic hydrogels. And indeed, when we stand for a, a contractile marker, the phosphorylated MLC, a myosin light chain, we could see that the, a, a, con, that the cells in the dynamic hydrogel are contractile. We also noticed that a, a, this a contractility is leading to integrin clustering. And you can see that with a, a, the a, basically clustering of integrin beta one in the dynamic and not in the non-dynamic. We also done some a, a, a PC, QPCR a, and show the differences in integrin a, beta one and integrin alpha V a, in the dynamic versus the non-dynamic. This lead to large a, a focal adhesion formation here marked by vinaculin. Again, that we could see the difference between the dynamic and non-dynamic. And when we inhibit the contractility of these cells with blabestatin, we could see, a, a, of course, a downregulation of the integrin clustering, and this leads also to inhibition of network when we inhibit cell contractility compared to a, a controls. We then a, looked into the activation and phosphorylation of focal adhesion kinases, and again, we could see upregulation in the dynamic hydrogel and the non-dynamic hydrogel when we inhibit phosphorylation of focal a, adhesion kinases we could see an inhibition of the network compared to the control. Our cells are not just sitting there and starting to make networks, they are actually a, a inter, in, a interact with the matrix, they start to degrade the matrix, and they degrade it a, a faster a, and better with the, in the dynamic hydrogel, and we, we, so we see that with expression of a, the membrane MT1 and MP, a, MP, MMP1 and MMP9, and again, when we uh, inhibit uh, with the general inhibitor of uh, MMPs, we could see inhibition of network formation. Nicely, we could also see that when we inhibit the MMP, we could see uh, that the degradation of the matrix that is seen here with the uh, reduction in stiffness, it's, it's slowing down uh, uh, with, with that inhibition. Nicely, these cells would also produce their own extracellular matrix, both collagen-4 and laminin. And you can see here very, very nicely in red, the collagen-4 is deposited around a luminal a structure in the dynamic hydrogels. Finally, we also examined if, uh, the relevancy of this system for in vivo as we were thinking about uh, therapeutics and we injected them with the endothelial colony forming cells. We can see here network forming and the dynamic hydrogels. And here you see uh, uh, the day seven, we see a uh, larger uh, vessels in those hydrogels. And we can also see uh, when we uh, inject the cells, and this was done subcutaneously, when we inject these cells with no cells, we see that these hydrogels, sorry, inject the hydrogels, we see that they encourage angiogenesis uh, by these CD31 positive cells in the high dynamic hydrogels, which we could barely find in the non-dynamic hydrogel. And if we found them, they would be typically at the interface between the tissue and the hydrogels. By injecting to the tail vein, either Evans blue or lectin, we, we also confirm the functionality of those uh, angiogenic vessels. 
we concluded that the dynamic uh, networks allow the uh, cells to contract and this activates integrin clustering followed by focal addition activation, MMP expression, and also extracellular matrix deposition. And all of that allow for a morphogenesis to happen. And with that, I'm gonna finish. I'm just gonna summarize that we, we found that oxygen tension regulate vascular fate uh, using a matrix remodeling. And it also regulates vascular integration with host vasculature and that a, a hydrogel network dynamic of viscoelasticity regulate vascular assembly. Uh, just to thank uh, all the people that done the work, I tried to mention throughout the presentation, of course, our collaborators and our funders. Great, thank you so very much, uh, Sharon, for the, the presentation. Uh, so next we're gonna turn things over to Dr. Laura Nicholson. So whenever you're ready to go. Thank you very much, Adam and the organizers for being able to participate in this meeting. So I will uh, continue the theme a little bit to talking, talking about the use of stem cells in regenerative medicine, but my focus is going to be on lung engineering. So um, I know that Adam mentioned that, that, that I founded Humocyte. In fact, about a year ago, I became the CEO of Humocyte. And um, so I'm now an adjunct professor at Yale. Um, my lab still runs there, uh, but, uh, but the vast majority of my time is spent uh, in my offices at Humocyte where we're growing engineered vessels uh, for clinical use. But I would say that uh, in this talk, I'm not going to focus on vascular engineering, uh, but more on lung engineering. And so the, the content in this presentation really is not related to any clinical products, uh, at least not yet. So I'd like to talk about uh, our, our approach to whole lung regeneration. This is an effort that we started uh, in, in my lab at Yale more than a decade ago. And uh, we, we were one of the first groups to show the feasibility of decellularizing native lung and then repopulating that acellular matrix with cells, lung cells, such that we could reconstitute an organ that could actually participate in gas exchange uh, for a few hours. Um, this report uh, came out in Science in 2010. And uh, frankly, at the time when we showed that we could repopulate an organ and, and achieve uh, gas exchange even for a short period of time, um, I, I was actually flabbergasted that that, that, uh, that, that was possible. Um, but since that time, we've really been working from these initial prototypes and really trying to hammer out some of the, uh, some of the obstacles that stand between us and engineering a lung that can exchange gas in the long term. So um, as I always say to my students uh, and postdocs, you know, it's important when you're, when you're thinking about regenerating a tissue that you want to be functional, it's uh, critical that you think about the, the, the key, uh, what, what we would call design criteria that go into whatever you're going to engineer that, that's going to really drive function. And uh, there are some fun facts about the human lung. Um, you know, the average human lung absorbs about five liters of pure oxygen every hour, which is actually a large volume of gas. Um, and it also excretes a, a similar volume of carbon dioxide every hour. This is accomplished through 200 million alveoli, each of which is about 200 microns in diameter. And uh, with the 23 generations of airway branching, there's actually roughly uh, 70 square meters of surface area in your chest, which is useful uh, for, for gas exchange and which provides this highly efficient gas exchange surface area. But if we think about um, what it would take to reconstitute a, a set of functional human lungs, uh, one of my one of my favorite facts that I that I tend to quote with uh, with stem cell biologists actually is that if we had organoids that we were growing in hydrogels uh, in, and if each of those organoids was 200 microns in size, we would need roughly two million dishes to get enough organoids to reconstitute a, a full human lung. And so clearly, um, just growing small, uh, small little organoids that represent individual alveoli is, is not gonna get us really to a functional organ. So as I mentioned, we have uh, in our early studies, we took acellular lung matrices that we carefully decellularized to really retain the alveolar structure and the microvascular structure. Um, and when we repopulated these organs and then implanted them in vivo, 
What we found was that the primary failure mode actually was intravascular clotting. So you can see an engineered lung that had been implanted into a rat for several hours on the left. And what you see is that it's sort of this beefy red appearance. And that's because th there was a lot of microvascular inter um, or, and, and intravascular coagulation. So this really led us to think very carefully about the alveolus, which is really the functional unit for gas exchange in the lung. And uh, really the, the alveoli in your lung are replicated uh, millions of times over and they're a fairly stereotypic structure. They contain about six or seven different cell types, um, including microvascular endothelium on, on the vascular side of the barrier, um, but also a, a, a collection of fibroblasts, which, which sit in the septae in the wall of the, uh, of the alveoli. And also they contain um, epithelial cells actually of two flavors, type one and type two epithelial cells. And the type one epithelial cells really stretch over the surface of the airway and uh, sit right on the other side of the basement membrane, right next to, to endothelial cells. And uh, I'll show you later on in this talk that we've done some single cell analysis to try to understand how these neighborhoods or collections of cells talk to each other in the normal alveolus. But, but just to start, you know, th this just sort of orients you to, to the different types of cells that are located uh, in the air sac. So when we began focusing more on, on providing a, a stable and complete endothelial layer in the vasculature uh, in order to avoid uh, clotting once we implant the lungs uh, into, uh, into na native living animals, uh, we realized uh, at first that, that there's actually two uh, flavors of endothelium, two, two broad flavors of microvascular endothelium in the lung. One is what we call blood endothelium, which it, it comes in contact with the bloodstream. But another form of endothelium is lymphatic endothelium, which as, you, as the name implies, lines all of the ducts of the lymphatic system. And there's actually a large lymphatic system in the lung that's very active. Um, the endothelium of the lymphatic system is by, by design much leakier than the endothelium of the, of the blood system. And so we became interested in really identifying the endothelial cells of the lung that would be blood endothelium as opposed to lymphatic endothelium. And blood and, 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 and lymphatic endothelium share a lot of markers, uh, but there are some distinctions. So we, we obtained a, uh, a transgenic rat that um, labels all of the lymphatic endothelial cells with uh, EGFP. Um, and these lymphatic endothelial cells ex express a transcription factor called PROX1. So as you can see in this image on the left, in the central portion of the lung, is uh, particularly lining the airways, is where the majority of the lymphatic endothelium resides, and that stains green. And so we were able to develop cell sorting methods whereby we could digest uh, whole rat lungs from these PROX1 GFP rats and really select out the endothelium that was negative for GFP so that we were really getting a purified uh, col cell collection of blood endothelium, which would presumably have higher barrier function. When we took these endothelial cells and seeded them into acellular lung scaffolds uh, that we had decellularized in the rat, you can see it in a low power image uh, on the left uh, that we were able to get fairly broad coverage of the microvasculature and the larger vessels in the lung. And you can see on the right that this is, this is an example of, of, micro, of, of end, blood endothelial cell seeding into the acellular lung matrix. And you can see that many of these cells uh, permeate into the small microvasculature in the septae surrounding the alveolars, surrounding the alveoli. When we look at marker expression of these cells that are seeded into the lung, we can see that the blood endothelial cells express a lot of markers that we would expect to see in native microvascular endothelium, including CD31, V cadherin, um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. VWF and also zona occludens one, which is an important molecule for forming tight junctions and forming barrier in between endothelial cells. And uh, as you can see from this, from this image on the right, when we measure the resistance of the capillary bed 
which we're able to do by, by flowing uh, culture medium through, through the vasculature and by measuring pressure drops across the vasculature over time. And we can calculate a cap capillary resistance. What you can see is that over time, as the, as the endothelial cells migrate into the microvasculature and begin to line the conduits, we see that, that uh, the capillary resistance actually goes down over time. And we viewed these as, as sort of positive uh, indicators that, that, uh, that the endothelial cells were adhering to the walls of the, of the uh, vessels and doing what they were supposed to do. We then also uh, performed assays that measured not just the resistance of the vasculature, but also the barrier function. Um, so, you know, one of the key, um, one of the key functions of, of the lung microvasculature and the epithelium is that it forms a tight barrier between the air in the air sacs and the blood in the microvasculature of the lung. Um, and so the ability to recapitulate that barrier function so that you don't get transudation of fluid across the alveolar barrier is really a key aspect of whole lung engineering. And what we found when we measured a barrier function or, or essentially flow rate uh, liquid flow rate going across the, the alveolar barrier from the vascular compartment into the airway compartment. Uh, what we found is that flow across that barrier tended to go down over time as the endothelial cells were cultured in the vasculature. And you can see on this image on the right, the, these, these blue uh, squares show that there's a slight decrease in fluid flow across the barrier. Um, and going along with that, that there's a concomitant increase in vascular flow that, that enters the pulmonary artery and then exits the pulmonary vein. And while these are, are both things that we would like to see, uh, what's important to note is that the flow rate um, in blue boxes here certainly does not go to zero over time. So that means that there's still quite a bit of fluid transudation from the, from the vasculature into the airways. And, um, and th that's, a nice, that, that's a nice way of uh, referring to drowning, actually. So if you, if you put a, a lung that's very leaky into an animal or into a human, then you'll get that fluid transudation into the airways and you'll basically drown the recipient. So, so the, the, the message here is that while, while providing uh, blood endothelial cells into the microvasculature certainly uh, helped with decreasing resistance and increasing barrier, and while it was helpful, in our hands, it was not sufficient. So then that, that caused us to look a little bit more carefully at not just the endothelium on the vascular side, but also to try to understand how the endothelium interacts with other cell types in, in the alveolus to maintain homeostasis and also to try to maintain barrier function. And uh, th this led to a set of experiments that was done by a very talented graduate student in my group, gr uh, group named Katie Leiby. She's an MD-PhD student. And uh, what, she, what she wanted to understand was the impact of different cell types, particularly endothelial cells, but also alveolar fibroblasts, on the differentiation and the growth of the, the, the epithelial stem cell of the lung, which is really the type 2 alveolar uh, epithelial cell. So, so in, in our alveoli, there are really two flavors of, of epithelium. There are the type 2 cells, which make surfactant and which allow our lungs to expand, but they're also the local progenitor cell for the type 1 epithelium. And the type 1 ep epithelial cells are the cells that really line most of the surface area of the alveoli and provide a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, barrier function. And so what Katie found um, is that by, by combining um, a, a really uh, a type two epithelial cell conducive medium, combining that with co-culture with both uh, fibroblasts and endothelial cells, she found that she was able to form really dense rings of, of alveoli that were lined almost entirely with type two epithelium, um, which is actually kind of an extraordinary finding um, because it means that she was able to essentially reconstitute the, the epithelial component you know, across an entire organ in a fairly organized fashion. What she also found was that when she just uh, seeded the, the, the 
epithelial progenitor cells just with endothelium, that, that, that the growth of the, of the epithelium was poor, and if she seeded them with just fibroblasts, that, that there was a lot of epithelial cell growth, but it was very disorganized. So having these two other cell types was really uh, pivotal for, for generating alveolar structures that contain really robust epithelium. And if we look at this a little bit more closely, um, again, there's, there's some immunostaining here for some markers that, that may not be familiar to some folks if you don't think about lung all the time. But, but essentially what, what this staining shows is that, is that in triculture lungs, um, we got a, a tremendous amount of, of what we would call um, native alveolar markers, uh, including um, uh, type two markers, which is, which is ABCA, ABCA3, um, and also Vimentin and NKX2.1. This just shows even a little bit more detail looking at, looking at the functionality or the ability of these type two cells to make an important uh, molecule, which is surfactant molecule, which allows, um, allows our lungs to inflate and, and lowers the, sur the surface tension in our lungs. Surfactant molecules are stored in, in lamellar bodies, and you can see that in triculture, the type two cells have huge numbers of lamellar bodies which contain surfactant that's waiting to be released from the cells. And uh, when we don't have triculture, we see many fewer of these lamellar bodies. So to finish up, I'm going to focus a little bit on some of our single cell work that has really tried to understand what are the conversations that are going on between the different cells in the alveolus. So this is, a, this is really a, a cartoon of these different cell types that we think are important and are present. Um, as I mentioned, there's the type one epithelial cell which covers most of the alveolus. There's the endothelium, the blood endothelium, which sits on the other side of the basement membrane. And those two cell types, which cover most of the surface area, are really separated by only about 500 or, or 50 or 100 nanometers. So, so, so it would not be surprising if those two cell types actually had very active conversations with each other. But in addition, there's type 2 cells, there's macrophages, and there's a couple different flavors of fibroblasts. So in order to understand in a very broad way how, how cells in the alveolus talk to each other, um, we really wanted to get a signature of lungness, a signature of, of what the alveolar uh, communication system looks like. And to do that, what we did is, is a single cell analysis of, of the connectomics between cells in the alveolus, but not just in one species. We, act, we actually looked in four species. We looked in mouse, rat, pig, and human, because our goal was to, was to not have species-specific uh, communication algorithms that we were focused on, but really to try to understand what is it about this collection of six different cell types that, that creates homeostasis um, across alveoli, across uh, all of these species. Because, you know, a rat alveolus looks a lot like a human alveolus. And so we speculated that, that the signaling would also be similar. And this is just a, one example of one signaling vector that we identified that's certainly not surprising. Um, th this is some single cell data looking at the expression of, of VEGF alpha. And as you can see, most of the VEGF is actually made by this cell cluster here, which is actually the type 1 epithelial cells in the alveoli. Similarly, if you look for the receptor for VEGF, you see that it's, that it's located almost entirely on the vascular endothelium, as you would expect. And so by, by looking at these two sets of data, we can essentially draw a vector that, for a signaling vector that connects the type one epithelium to the endothelium in the alveolus. And so we've, one of, another graduate student in my lab, Sam Reardon has done terrific work here, looking at, um, looking at how we can generate sort of a connectome or, or a co collection of conversations uh, between these different cell types. And what he's shown is that if you, if you look at multiple cell types in the lung, so this is not just the alveolus, but this is cell types even higher up in the airways, it's possible to, to draw vectors of communication between these different cell types and then to graph that visually. And as you can see, the, the, the connectomics of, of cell communication in the human lung is actually at a gross level, uh, bears a lot of similarity to the connectomics in the mouse lung, which is shown on the right here. 
Specifically, the fibroblasts in the alveolus are incredibly important signalers to type one and type two cells in the alveolus, as well as um, to other epithelial cells. And, and that's just one example of a conserved signaling pattern. So we do believe that we're making progress in understanding what are the key signals that, that cells in the alveolus need to talk to each other and to maintain their function and their, and their stability. And we believe that once we're able to tease out this, this roadmap of communication, we'll be able to translate that into our engineered lung system and really provide the right cues so that we can generate alveoli that, that are functional where these five or six different cell types are, are all behaving as they should. So I'll just finish up there. Um, I, I really wanna thank my fabulous group at Yale who's been working on this problem for a long time. And uh, I'll take any questions at the end of the session. Great. Thank you so very much, Laura. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And I'll, I'll have to steal that term cell conversation, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so our, our last speaker um, joins us from Rice University. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jordan Miller. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, thanks for the invitation. So we're looking at uh, tissue and, and organ engineering uh, from a bottom-up approach, looking at 3D printing to structure and figuring out that ultrastructure. You know, the way that we're looking at this is similar to, if you think about the amazing engineering that's in the phones in our pockets now, we started from a very crude uh, single transistor, right? It was very large and there was one, it was functional unit of compute. And that has scaled through Moore's law, gotten miniaturized. And now we have billions of transistors inside of our phones. We have a similar type of challenge that Laura was really explaining um, clearly where we have to think about what is the vascular unit cell inside of our functional organs, organs like the lung and the liver and the pancreas and the kidneys, they do have similar types of architectural design patterns where we have a functional vascular unit cell and is replicated and scaled up uh, hundreds of millions of times in our organs. And so we're asking the question of how can we design such unit cells from scratch, and then we have a lot of work to do to miniaturize them and replicate them hundreds of millions of times. So generally, this idea is centered in, uh, oh, and sorry, as a disclosure, uh, we have a startup company, Volumetric, that is commercializing this technology. So we're really focusing on the structure function relationships in living tissue. And in biology, we have this idea of form follows function, where the form of a biological structure is could be anything from a single protein structure all the way to the limb of an organism or the organism itself. It's really an evolutionary consequence of its function. And in tissue engineering, we're really asking the converse question, will function follow form? If we can make the structure that replicates what we see in the body, how much of that do we need to replicate using a very reductionist perspective? Could we build up structures from scratch that begin to mimic some of these functions? And would that be sufficient to help human patients? So one of the challenges that we think about a lot is how are we gonna get enough cells? And a lot of us are um, in this regime. So I have here an exponential graph along the bottom 10 to the zero, so cell number per construct, 10 to the zero single cell biology way over here. A lot of our lab's work is here and we really need to be thinking about the organ scale. We have hundreds of billions of cells in our organs. And so we need at least one to 10 billion cells in organ scaffolds to begin to replicate some of that biochemical function that is an additive uh, sum of all of the cells and all of their efforts inside of a effectively portable volume that fits inside of our body, right? If I make an organ that is 10% as efficient as the liver, it has to be 10 times bigger, and that's not going to fit inside of your torso. So we can grow billions of cells, and a lot of you are growing a lot more cells than we do. Um, this is what a billion cells looks like in a single 50 mil conical. But when we're talking about adherent cells and a lot of the parenchymal cells we're interested in, we are not able to keep these alive for very long. As soon as we trypsinize them, we're starting a clock to cell death. And instead we have to just aliquot the cells down, uh, freeze them down and try to use them when we can. So if you, if you take these cells, what if you just stick them in a gel? So uh, this is really a lot of the early work in the field where um, you do an experiment like this. This is our take on it. So you have a thick slab of gel, thick from a cell's perspective, five millimeters, very thin from a human perspective. But we can load it up with tons of cells, 40 million cells per mil. These are HEK cells that are expressing a destabilized EGFP. 
And if you grow this for a couple of days, you take a cross section through it. This is false color for the destabilized GFP. You see that you get a crust layer of cell survival. It's, it looks like a slice of bread where you have the outer surface. That is where oxygenation is happening when you're making bread. That's where oxygenation is happening in our tissues when we're making these thick slabs. So we showed that if you have just very simple channels inside of these gels, you can get flow through them. And when you have that flow, can, can each individual vessel, here we're looking at 800 micron vessels inside of these tissue slabs, uh, they are able to keep a circumferential volume of cells alive in contrast to tissues that don't have any vessels. But you see, it's not a perfect job here. We have lots of dead zones still in the tissue that we needed to optimize. If we looked at this further uh, more recently, uh, this is the work of Ian Kinslinger in our group who just went on to start his postdoc in Boston. And uh, he has been looking at HEPG2 cells. We can talk about the value of HEPG2 cells in tissue screening. The point is that they're, they're mammalian cells that are highly metabolically active. We were able to quantify that these vessels they in, in highly proliferative cells, we're getting escalating gradients of survival. You can see here with the MTT staining and escalating proliferation gradients that you're seeing here that tend to follow each other. And we think the cells are, these are in non-degradable gels in this case, where we think the cells are proliferating closer to the vessel and dying further away. So the reason this happens is the same reason and, and same thought process that goes into the design of cities actually. So just as a vibrant city needs roads, a vital organ has to have vasculature. So with a city, we have certain city blocks where the residents live. So here's a, a great picture of Paris. And uh, in our tissues, we have the areas where our cells are residing, they're in place, they're in trapped inside the solid, and we have to have these highways. If you imagine a city that didn't have roads, how would you get your furniture home? How would you get groceries home? How would you take out the trash? This is exactly the same challenge that our cells have to do at a micron scale. And if we don't provide the highways for that nutrient and waste transport, it's not gonna be a very efficient tissue and the cells are going to die very rapidly. We have to think about this, the total organ scale. Um, in our liver, it's the same story, very large organ over half of the volume of the liver is liquid. The concept of solid organs actually a misnomer, right? Of our, or, our large volumetric organs are more than half uh, liquid with perfusion volumes. That includes the blood vessels, includes the lymphatics, and includes things like the bile duct tree in the liver, the urinary tree in the kidneys. So we used, uh, in this case, we're using projection stereolithography. So it's adapting techniques from the 3D printing industry that have been around for uh, almost 40 years now, a lot of these ideas, and adapting them into biology and biomaterials that we can structure the material better and then interrogate in a, in a very reproducible way, how functional is that architecture? So we're using a uh, layer by layer projection where a light sensitive polyethylene glycol acrylate gel is being polymerized. We can also do this with gelatin with acrylate in degradable settings. Every individual layer is a different image getting projected and uh, effectively building up the object. So what we like about using 3D printed hydrogels, you can make really intricate blood vessel networks. You can see here, uh, here we're perfusing in two different materials. We have colloidal black ink, India ink going in that gets trapped and stays inside of the vessels. We're also perfusing in red food coloring, a small hydrophilic dye that diffuses out. And you can see it looks like this Voronoi architecture resembles what you might see in, in a city block diagram. This would be a hard city to drive through. Uh, maybe this feels more like, uh, I remember my times in Boston. And so you have these individual city blocks. We're gonna have the cell residents live and we need to see how fast can we deliver nutrients and oxygen to the cells that we trap there. We needed to go more complicated. So we began to build up different architectural concepts and explore these new design freedoms in tissues based on this technique. So here's a torus knot. It actually is uh, reminiscent to me of the glomerulus in the kidney. Here we can do an inlet outlet, which is the torus and the torus knot is the red topology that sits on the surface of the torus. You can see what the individual uh, photo mass would look like to build that object up and how that would then build up to make the object. So the photo mass in the upper left up here, and we're building up the object one layer at a time. We have now two independent vessel networks with branches inside of the same tissue architecture, so this hydrogel material. This is what it would look like if we could get the flow to work. And in fact, we were able to get the flow to work inside of the vessel. Now this is 
Again, not at the scale we would like to do to make organs. These vessels, in this case, are around 500 microns in diameter. We'll talk about getting to smaller diameter vessels, but this was exciting to us because it represented the ability to do multivascular architecture two or more independent vessel networks inside of one gel. We can put different materials in, use one for in, one for out, lots of different ways to think about this. Now, this was exciting to us, but this is not what our organs look like. Our organs look like this, right? And uh, you may notice or recognize the artist on the left here. This is from Leonardo da Vinci over 500 years ago, where he was really noticing this multi-branching architecture. So we have the heart here, we have the blood vessels from the heart going down into the lung, but you can also see an other, another interpenetrating multi-scale architecture, the ribs of cartilage of the trachea going down also. And as far as Leonardo da Vinci could see down into the bottom of the lung and the distal components, he continued to see the branching go all the way down. We still have a limited ability to understand the total architecture of the lung. You can do a CAT scan of the whole um, vasculature of the lung. You can see just the vasculature, vasculature here, not the airways, and you can see the capillaries because the CAT scan doesn't have that kind of resolution. Uh, this upper right image, this is actually a beautiful photo from Laura Nicholson's lab. Thank you, Laura. Um, this is resin casting um, of the airway of the lung, and you can see the beautiful, amazing architecture of the alveolar air sacs all the way at the bottom here. But then this resin casting technique, you know, you can't see the vasculature too because we're really looking at the resin uh, inner. Uh, uh, getting into the airway to, to cast it. Um, and then other groups, so this is work from Zhao Chen's group where he's looking at the developmental biology of the lung from scratch and looking at that architectural development. So we were taking inspiration here thinking, you know, we can't make a lung yet. Uh, so we're trying to think about what is that vascular unit cell? Could we design it on the computer? Could we build it up? And uh, we were able to do that inside of the gel. So you can see here, we're inflating the air sac we're getting deoxygenated red blood cells coming in and then sheathing vascular architecture. They're picking up oxygen coming out. And we were able to uh, further show some design paradigms we think could be useful where you would first computationally grow the airway. This in collaboration with Nervous System, a design firm uh, in New York, and then populate the tips of these branches with these alveolar air sacs. And uh, we can't yet scale this up, you know, uh, right? We're, so we're trying to build this up further. But um, this was our uh, version that we were able to show that some of that architectural complexity would impinge on the vessels in different ways uh, based on the local curvature of the airway. So this is strictly topology and there's not any cells in the bulk of the matrix. Those are human red blood cells we're perfusing through, but what about cellularizing these tissues? So we have been looking at uh, more recently endothelializing these vessel architectures. You can see here, uh, I just published recently where we're injecting endothelial cells in. We actually did a detailed protocol of how this works. We're injecting the cells in, we're rotating the tissue around. How do you rotate a tissue around if it's in a multi-well plate? Well, you're gonna need actually these 3D printed chambers that we also built and open sourced. You can download um, off of the Nature Protocols website or off of our uh, GitHub repository. And we have a whole set of protocols for how to uh, both 3D print the gel, 3D print the chambers, uh, all the parts to do this. And uh, even the machine that you can build, download 3D print the parts and it will auto rotate your gels for you. So uh, this has been really exciting for us and, and very useful for all of our individual seating steps. So more recently, we've been looking at going higher resolution. We've now been able to get, you know, initially we had the 300 micron vessels in the alveolar air, air sac. Now we're getting down to sub 100 micron, in some cases around 50 micron vessel diameter. We're able to also, um, get good perfusion through there, as you can see here. Uh, here, these can get perfused strictly by capillary actions, but obviously if we're gonna grow human cells, we wanna do this in a more pumping perfusion way. Um, so we've been looking into that as well. Uh, you can see these gels maintain their elasticity. We're looking at what is the optimal balance between vascular architecture and interstitial zones. If you have too much vasculature, it's gonna look like something like rosacea or something where way too many vessels not enough room for tissue function. Um, we've also been able to now endothelialize vessels. So sorry, before I get to that, we, uh, given some of the talks about cancer, um, we're also looking at, you know, just because you have a vascular channel doesn't mean you have to do flow perfusion through there. You might think about structuring multivascular architecture. One of the vessel networks, you could inject a solid plug of cells 
But when they all die, well, they wouldn't all die if you have a second vascular network that is perfusing the nutrients through them. So here are some lung adenocarcinoma cells, uh, double labeled for the cytoplasm and the nuclei, and just showing that the cells are, are doing okay there. Um, so here now we're injecting QVEX. These are um, expressing constituent of GFP into these 50 micron vessel networks. Um, some of these images we're very happy with. Some of this process is very difficult. And in this paper, we actually highlighted some of the pitfalls and dangers and complexities of endothelialization and perfusion. There's lots of ways to do this wrong. So uh, we found in the gels, if you don't do perfusion, the cells tend to die. They need to have those nutrients coming in. Um, if you overseed, you'll get these endothelial nodules that seem to be um, some kind of uh, bad physiology, maybe pathophysiology of the endos. That could be something interesting to study. We're trying to get really better endothelium. Um, if you don't do the rotation correctly, uh, other ways to get non-uniform seeding. And uh, bubbles are always going to be something you're, you're scared of when you're doing flow perfusion studies. So definitely want to have bubble traps, et cetera. Once you solve all those problems though, we've been able to get uh, really, this is unpublished work, but we were able to get uh, very exciting to us, vascular networks that are patterned, that uh, have vessel components that are under 50 micron in diameter. We're able to get flow through these. So here we can see five micron fluorescent beads flowing through what looks like effectively a percolation network that's endothelialized. We even have some of the endothelial cells beginning to sprout androgenic sprouts into the vessel. So we're still studying this in detail, but these are degradable gels. They're mostly based on gelatin methacrylate, and it's sufficiently simple enough for the cells to grow and migrate through. They secrete their MMPs and go through. It's, it's a lot simpler than some of the uh, maybe random estrobon hydrolysis techniques that, that uh, our field really came from. And um, we're really looking at that endothelial physiology now. So we, we really needed new technologies to get the architecture. Now we have the architecture looking back at biology, what can we get for the endothelial cells? How stable are we? Uh, are they, are we getting flow alignment? It seems it's possible. Uh, we're getting some evidence of that. We're looking at the VEC adherence, we're getting good cell-cell junctions and studying the permeability quantitatively of these vessels. We can do uh, confocal microscopy and show what is the nature of some of these nascent androgenic sprouts. Uh, how many cells are there? Are they connected? Where their nuclei? Look at the phylloidin. Um, very exciting to us. now. What about this city block region that we wanna put cells in? Well, this is uh, even more recent. We have now, this is work from uh, Dan Caesar, who also uh, just defended his PhD and also moved to Boston to do his uh, postdoc, uh, or sorry, he's working in industry now, but over in Boston. Um, so now we have individual micro wells that are at very specific distances from our vascular endothelial networks. You can see here, we're looking at lung adenocarcinoma cells, just a very good positive control for us of just, are the cells alive or not? Are they able to capture nutrients? Um, and so you can see from day zero to day three, the cells and their aggregates begin to grow. Uh, further, what we have, uh, we're actually now seeing the cancer cells beginning to migrate out of their micro wells, perhaps towards the vasculature. And we're seeing how close can we make this distance um, I don't think we can get down to sub one micron distance yet. Um, it's something that we may not be able to do by 3D printing anytime soon, but uh, it may be moot if this is reproducible enough that we can study things like the androgenic switch or things like delivering specific um, uh, factors to stem cell aggregates in, in these different areas. So this is brand new work we're very excited about, uh, very excited for potential collaborations uh, with any of you. So I'd be glad to follow up um, just overall in general, you know, what we're trying to do is think about what is the total organ structure. We definitely can't make that yet, but we're very excited for a pathway of a Moore's law like scaling that, are, that we need to do that our field is, is in, in process of doing to get hundreds of millions of these vascular unit cells inside of a packed volume in a way that they're all connected and plumbed just like it is inside the organs. Um, and we can do that by looking at organ structure, breaking it down on the anatomy side, but there's a lot of mappings of organ structure uh, in the literature from decades ago. And some of the newer ideas are we could build a de novo vascular network that uses characteristics of the in vivo environment and the in vivo network topology, regrow a synthetic topology would be cleaner to grow and modulate in terms of structure, put that into the gel and then study function. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the lab. So um, McGregor Gregorian led up a lot of the early work in the, the science paper. 
uh, Ian Kinslinger and others on the endothelialization of the gels and looking at these uh, growth and proliferation gradients. And uh, Maddie and Kristen doing a lot of the um, recent work on endothelialization of the smaller vessels together with uh, Dan Caesar. Um, so thanks.